Hi, I'm Roxy, and today I'm going to show you how I paint rocks. And when I say rocks, I don't mean a self-portrait, I mean those things that are made out of sand. So uh, the first thing we're going to need is reference. And uh, you're probably thinking, if there's one thing I can draw off the top of my head, surely it's a rock, because rocks are rocks, right? Um, well, firstly, don't say that in front of a geologist. And secondly, consider what environment your rock is going to sit in. A classic angular rock like this won't make sense everywhere. For example, in and around calm water, rocks are typically quite smooth, like these uh, river pebbles or these big island boulders. Where water is violent, rocks can be extremely jagged, looking like they're going to cut you and like it. In a desert scene, rocks may resemble giant anthills. Uh, if they're in a humid place, like a jungle, you might only see parts of the rock because of flora overgrowth. In caves, you get stalactites. Those are the ones that hang off the roof, which are smooth and drippy looking, because that's how they were formed, from minerals dripping off the ceiling. And uh, the stalagmites are the ones that are on the floor, whose drips from the ceiling pulled up and made blobs. Around cliffs and earthquakes, you often see sedimentary rock, which have these bands of mud and sand that have been compressed down into layers. Volcanic rock uh, looks like solid black mud blobs, and uh, if it's still in the process of cooling, maybe you'll have some kind of glow. And uh, finally, if it's an alien landscape, it's often popular to go with uh, thin geometric looking rocks or jagged crystals because they just look alien. So a rock isn't just a rock. You need to look for reference and uh, then analyze said reference in order to build up a visual library inside your mind. Um, this isn't just for rocks, this is for everything you paint. I like to use Pinterest myself. Um, I've got a reference board for almost everything, um, including one for rocks. When I'm creating a board, I typically go to a free stock website like pxhere.com or unsplash.com. I do a search for rocks or whatever it is that I'm looking for. Pin a few appropriate pictures to a board and uh, then I'd probably scroll down. If we click on here, Pinterest tries to find similar pictures based on subject matter and, and uh, pictures that other people have pinned with similar shapes or colors or whatever. So it's not always accurate, the algorithm. It's, uh, it is just AI, but keep scrolling and eventually you'll, you'll find pictures that uh, maybe you want to add to your board. And the more of these kind of pictures that you add, the better that algorithm is going to get. The other thing you can do is if you click on an image, an individual image, and scroll down, it'll often show you a whole bunch of pictures based, uh, similar pictures based on that individual image. So you can quickly build up a really nice reference library for yourself. So I'm going to pick one of these and do a demo for you. Now, the way I see it, there's three ways to go about painting rocks. The first method is to block in the silhouette and then build up the 3D form by painting the light. So we've got our reference there and I'm going to forget about all extraneous detail and just concentrate on shape design. Now you'll see I'm not copying the reference exactly. Using reference doesn't mean straight up copying. This is your rock. You decide how you want it to look. Well, technically it's my rock. And I'll do with it as a damn well please. But uh, the point is, use reference but deviate from it in order to create something visually interesting. That's when you go from being able to copy something accurately, which is more of a technical skill, to actually being an artist, to creating something. Now you'll notice that I've not just been painting the silhouette, but I've also been cutting into it and refining it. 
and uh, that's because I'm cognizant of the fact that this is a rock and those edges need to be sharp. And on that note, let's talk a little bit about the brushes, um, the tools that you use, because they can make a difference. You can use a round brush to paint rocks, but why make life difficult for yourself? Rather use something like this with a, with a flat edge that does half the work for you. I mean, unless, of course, you're actually painting pebbles, then, you know, a round brush is going to make sense, naturally giving you those round shapes that you're looking for. This picture below of the, the jagged rocks, I actually used quite a thin brush for that because I knew that there were going to be peaks and it would just be a lot easier. So use the right tool for the right purpose and uh, make your life easier. Also make sure that the brush that you use can actually make a hard edge. Um, I see a lot of amateurs, they like to use these airbrushy kind of brushes and everything tends to have this really indistinct look but you know for crying out loud these are rocks so if you want to use the soft brushes there's a place for that and that's stuff like clouds and fog and mist and things like that but uh, be bold use a use a brush that can create a sharp edge so we have our silhouette but we also need to know where the light sources are and this applies to any painting you always need to have at least a rough idea of where your light sources are located in the scene. And this will help you choose the right value for each plane and make it pop off the canvas instead of you know, looking like amateur hour clip art. Uh, and in the reference image, we can see where the light sources are. We, we basically have ambient light from the sky and light is stronger on the front left side. Um, however, your painting, maybe the light is different. So you need to keep that in mind so that everything in your scene looks cohesive. You might need to deviate from the, uh, from the reference picture and have the lighting coming from somewhere else. Um, you know, if the rock is outside, which I'm guessing it is, you're probably going to have two light sources, a soft ambient light coming from the sky, uh, probably a brighter light from the sun or moon. Um, unless it's midday where the, the sun is directly overhead, the light from the sun will probably be off to the side. Um, and if it's a sunset or sunrise, then uh, you know you, you might have the scene where the sun is actually behind the rocks and you might get a bit of a rim light. So there's a couple of scenarios that you need to take into consideration and what's going to work for you. Um, here I'm just going to basically do the light from the same uh, angle as, as the reference. So putting um, lighter shapes on top because we know that it's the rocks are going to be lighter on top. And as I'm painting, I'm designing the top face of the rocks basically. Now I'm doing another face on the left hand side. Lighter than the silhouette but not as light as the top which um, in my mind in, in this little scene the top is going to have the brightest edge. It can be any way you like, so long as you're consistent about it. Everything in your scene needs to obey the same lighting, wherever you've chosen your light source to be. Now, up until this point, I've just actually been painting in grayscale, which is perfectly fine. Painting in grayscale has a little bit of a benefit that it helps you get your values correct right from the start. And the other benefit is that you have a chance to build up your saturation. Um, it's a lot easier to build up saturation than knock back saturation if you've already gone too bright or, or too intense at first. So putting a very pale wash of brown over the rocks and then I, I choose a little bit more saturated and a little bit more light and just dabbing on some colors, slowly building up the saturation. These are warm browns because it's, uh, in, in my mind, this is a daylight scene, but if you're painting, you know, a night scene, you're probably going to be using more cooler grays, like um, maybe with a hint of blue. 
but the sun's warm so the kind of spectrum we're looking for is yellows and reds and there's no specific right or wrong colors it all depends on several things it depends on the type of rock it depends on uh, your overall gamut um, you know a lot of artists like to limit their palette so um, maybe your atmosphere has a heavy green tint which is going to affect everything else in the scene and you're not going to have the full gamut of colors to work with and uh, also as I mentioned it depends on the time of day and the position of the sun or the moon if there are any other light sources like fluorescent lights or a city any reflections coming from, like let's say the rock is situated in water and it's wet maybe you have some reflections coming onto the rock from from the water just keeping it very simple in this demo though a simple daylight scene so before i put too much detail in and detailing simply means making your brush smaller zooming in and doing the same thing over and over doing what we've already been doing designing shapes making sure that the values are correct making sure that um, little pieces of the rock that are facing upwards and towards the light are lighter than those facing away and so forth but um, uh, before we get to in detail i want to show you a little trick that you might like um, if your painting program allows you to paint with textures um, like Corel Painter um, and by the way I do have a tutorial on um, painting with textures which I'll link in the description but uh, just to show you an option this isn't something that you need to use what I've got here is a brush with a rock texture it's just a, a simple rock texture that I found online that I pulled in as a texture and you can see that I've set it to 100% grain so it's just painting that texture and this is perfect for our purposes so I'm going to create a new layer and start lightly brushing that texture um, with a dark color into the shadows and uh, I'm specifically using a new layer because sometimes it helps to knock down the opacity of the layer maybe the texture is too contrasty so you can knock it back that way or there might be parts of the texture you don't like so you can easily erase that afterwards so after I've done the uh, the shadows I select a lighter color and use the same texture brush on uh, the lighter planes of the rock I just want to remind you that this is a completely optional step you don't have to paint on the textures you can uh, decide for yourself where you want the cracks and the fissures and that sort of detail to be on the rock but uh, if you do use this method it can help you just add a little bit of randomness you can even just use it as a guide and paint over it delete it afterwards whatever so here we've got the whole uh, rock collection covered in that rock texture and I'll create another layer get a nice thin brush and start using the texture as a guide for where some cracks might be so I'll start with black and paint in some cracks I don't have to paint the cracks where the texture indicates it's it's just an option for me now that I've got the basic cracks in what I'll do is I'll grab the lightest color that I have um, in this range of colors and paint along the edge of each crack um, trying to imagine which part of the crack might be facing the light to just give that a little bit of an edge of light and again because this is on a separate layer I can easily just knock it back a little erase parts that I don't like and when I'm happy with everything I'll of course just collapse the layers into one to make it easier for me to continue the painting so I could go further with this um, but it is just a quick demo and there we go that's method one completed and uh, method two is what I like to call the chaos method 
what I've created here is a brush that um, it's very unpredictable in the kind of dabs that it places on the canvas. How I've done this is um, it's just a, a normal dab that I've designed but instead of uh, close spacing like you'd usually have on a brush you'll see it's using like a hundred percent a normal brush would be like five percent maybe less so these dabs are going to be spaced quite far apart and the other difference is that I've set the angle to jitter so it's not all going to be the same shape right way up. What this does is it gives a chaotic effect that you can use to play around and find something that you like. Um, so instead of consciously designing the silhouette from reference like we did in method one, this is more kind of leaving it up to chance, but you don't have to use the very first uh, strokes that you put on the canvas. Maybe it, you're not feeling it. You, you can always undo. That's the joy of a digital canvas. And keep making marks until you find something that you can kind of see rocks in it. I mean, you could also use this for foliage for a number of things. But in this case, we're looking for something that looks rocky. There have been a couple of promising ones already, but uh, let's go with this one. Once we've got our chaos down on the canvas, then uh, we switch to our normal brush. And we do the same thing as we did in the first method, and that's to paint the light. So here I am, I'm painting the, what I believe is going to be the, the top faces of the rocks. I'll also just tighten up the silhouette a little bit. Then I'll paint a side plane in. So now assuming that uh, as opposed to the top one, let's say that this is a night scene. Let's go with more of a bluish palette. And I'm doing exactly the same thing as I did before. I start off brushing over a color lightly and then we'll slowly build up the saturation in smaller areas. Looking a bit purple for my taste, so moving a little bit more into the blue range. Then I'll grab black and uh, just darken a few things that seem to me could go darker. So that's method one and two. Very similar, it's really just the start of it that differs. The third method is about sketching the facets of the rock using lines and then filling them in after. And what you're watching here is a time lapse of this method in action. Uh, this was something I did back in January as part of the Creationary Social Challenge. That's where you follow a prompt list to draw, paint, or sculpt some sort of creature every day of the month. And this particular one was called um, an axolotl. I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but it's some sort of rock spirit from Inuit folklore. There was nothing to go on in terms of description, besides the fact that it was a rock spirit. So it was an exercise in conceptualization, and my idea was to create the creature's body out of rocks, but held together by a bright blue light. You'll see that later, but for now I just want to point out what I'm doing here. I start the painting by very lightly sketching the body shape of the creature using basic geometric shapes to indicate the anatomy. Blocks for arms, things like that. And then once I had the wireframe, I started sketching irregular shaped cubes within that uh, envelope. And the cubes are going to become rocks. So once I had all the cubes in place, I created a new layer above that and started drawing over it with more certain line work, using the layer below as a guide. 
Often when I'm using this method, I'll drop the opacity of the layer below and I might even repeat the process several times um, on new layers each time until I'm happy with the quality of the line work. The next step was to put down some basic values. In my mind, even though I know the rocks are going to be held together by light, and that of course is going to affect the values, we also still have to factor in external light. And that typically means that top facing facets are lighter, except if they're being occluded by something above it. In other words, if the object above it is close enough to block out the light. But typically speaking, the top facing facet is lighter and uh, with the exception of you know rear lighting scenarios the bottom facing facets are typically darkest because they're facing away from the ambient light of the sky or the ceiling lights once i had these basic values in place i grabbed a brown color and painted over everything in multiply mode uh, if you want to try this but don't like how multiply darkens the values you can try color mode or overlay mode instead they work uh, just as well they just don't darken everything at this point i thought it looked too much like a golem instead of a spirit so i thought chopping of the legs would solve that issue plus it looks way more red so I went through each layer erasing that part and uh, started constructing a new bottom half. So I used the same technique. I first create the wireframe of the envelope uh, and then make sure to constrain my rock cubes to the parent shape. Just to skip ahead a bit, here you see me adding some bright blue light to glue the rocks together, a bit of grass to give the impression that uh, he just rose up from the earth still with clumps of sod on him. Then I started slowly bringing more brighter saturated colors into the rocks, kind of like what I did with the first two methods. Worked on the glow of the blue light being careful to keep the most intensely bright parts small and sharp while the glow itself is bigger and softer and also doing some very thin bright cracks as if the light was seeping through the rock fissures then it was just a matter of detailing so that's the line sketching method but i want to point out stylistically this method doesn't have to end up looking comic style like this. I purposefully chose that style. Um, so I painted on a layer underneath the lines so that the line work would be maintained to give that comic look. But I could have easily painted on top of the lines instead and achieved the same style as the first two demos. I guess I could also have done some line work afterwards on top of the first two demos um, as a last step to make them more like this one. So the point I'm trying to make is that it doesn't matter what style you want to end up with. That's more about rendering. You can make each method suit your own art style. You can use any of the three methods I've shown you to get the desired result. And I encourage you to try all three. You might find that you're particularly comfortable with one method and end up starting all your paintings that way and that's of course fine or if you like me you might enjoy using all three methods for different circumstances and i'm sure you've had the epiphany by now that this tutorial isn't really about rocks it's about figuring out different ways to start painting regardless of subject matter so quick recap all three methods start with gathering and studying reference even if you don't plan to use it, looking at reference is going to help no matter what you do. Um, and all three methods end with rendering it in the style that you want to achieve. So the very beginning and the end of all methods are the same. For the blocking in method, you design a silhouette and you paint the light. For the chaos method, you use a brush that creates randomness. You pick out and expand on shapes and details from the chaos. For the line construction method, 
you make a rough sketch, maybe knock back the opacity and do a more refined drawing on top of that. You repeat the process until you have a drawing that you can work with and then you start painting under or on top of the lines. With all three methods you need to be cognizant of where your light sources are, where each facet is facing, what kind of brush is going to achieve the best result, and you need to build up the saturation of your colors slowly. And those are our three methods. Before I end this tutorial though, I just want to point out that if you enjoyed this particular painting and wanted to see more of the process, because I know that I kind of moted through it, um, I have the full hour and a half non-time-lapsed recording available for my patrons. Uh, you can find my Patreon link in the description. And on that note, thank you to my patrons for your much appreciated support. And thank you for watching. Much obliged if you leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Until the next one, God bless.